Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm JP Karliak. I'm a president and founder of Queerbox, the online academy and community for LGBTQIA plus voice actors. Um, like animation and video games, audiobooks have been a major topic of conversation amongst our students, and there's a lot of excitement surrounding tonight's event, so we're very excited for this. Uh, this panel has been long in the making, and we are so thankful to tonight's partner, Penguin Random House Audio, for bringing the idea to us. And as always, we are ever grateful to our hosting partner, The Help Network, for providing a forum for these conversations. We also want to acknowledge that this is Indigenous Peoples Day, and though our discussion tonight centers on LGBTQIA plus representation, the queer and Indigenous communities share in our mutual need for authenticity, equity, and diversity. Most obviously, in our intersectionality. Queervox and our sibling organizations, Voices of Color and the PGMVO List, celebrate our two-spirit and queer Indigenous members. Both populations also share an urgency of need as we both, both face violence and erasure. While our history, struggles, and victories are different, queer and indigenous people alike deserve opportunity and visibility to see and hear themselves in media, to earn wealth telling their stories, and to receive recognition for the value their voices bring to the table. So tonight, as we come to you from New York and Los Angeles, ancestral land of the Lenape and Tongva tribes stolen by colonizers, I invite everyone to join me in considering the original stewards of the land we inhabit, whose present descendants, whether consciously or unconsciously, we've relegated to being invisible in our lives. And as we work toward true visibility and acknowledgement, consider the possibilities of radical change. To imagine a society and an industry where cis, straight, white, and male are not the defaults, where we take the time to mentor new underrepresented talent rather than stick to who we know, and where we recognize that just because time-honored methods were financially successful doesn't mean they were right or the only route to financial success. Such radical change benefits indigenous, queer, and all underrepresented communities. From what I've learned about the efforts of Penguin Random House Audio and the larger audiobook publishing industry, I'm encouraged by the steps they're taking in this direction, and I think multiple voiceover touched industries can learn from them. I hope after tonight, you feel the same. Now, I'd like to introduce our moderator. Among his many credits as a voice actor, he has portrayed the title role in Jackie Chan Adventures and the Cabbage Merchant in Avatar The Last Airbender, a role he will reprise in the flesh in the upcoming Netflix series. Yeah! <laughs> he is also the author and audiobook narrator of his novels, All Kinds of Other and Still Life Las Vegas, as well as the narrator of Soul Lanterns and the upcoming The Stand-Up Groomsman. If you've ever seen his Instagram, then you also know his dinner parties are also worth doing crime to be invited to. Please welcome <laughs> James C. Hi, friend. Hey, thank you, JP. Now, JP obviously knows how to angle for a return visit to my dining room table, so... You did a great job. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is James C. And uh, I'm really, really excited for this panel because I have such a great love and respect for uh, the audiobook world, both as a writer and as a voiceover person. Um, as a writer, it I would have thought that I would have loved to just do my own book and, you know, and and have that kind of bragging right. But in my last book, All Kinds of Other, I was able to share narrating duties with someone else. And I have to tell you, when you get the right narrator and they they can just bring out like so many colors and nuances that you as the writer did not even know were there. So um, it was just so exciting to hear my words being, you know, um, brought to life and not by me. <laughs> um, as a voiceover person, uh, I, I just love audiobooks. It, it really, it suits my introverted nature, maybe. And there's something very special about it, uh, creating this entire world. Uh, it's very, very different, a very different skill set for, from the other voiceover kind of things I do. Um, and that's something that we'll get into during this evening. We're going to, um, talk to this great panel, um, for me, I got into uh, audiobooks because I wrote a book, and then they asked if I wanted to narrate it, and I said, sure. And it, it was very a very easy answer. 
Um, so if I were to give you advice, I would say the way into audiobooks would be to write your own book and then then narrate it. So luckily, I have a really amazing panel of people who can give you actually better advice than that. Um, so we're going to have some discussions, some topics, both about the nuts and bolts of uh, doing audiobooks and getting into the field. And then uh, we'll kind of segue into more um, queer specific topics and challenges um, facing our community and audiobooks. And then for the last hour, maybe or so, um, we'll open it up to questions. So if you have any questions, um, there's on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little Q&A menu. And you could click on that and then just type in your question and we'll try to get to as many as we can during that last hour. So without further ado, um, I'd like to uh, make some introductions and I'm going to have them actually talk about themselves and their journey into audiobooks. Um, let's start with some narrators. Um, let's start with Emily Wu Zeller, who is, uh, I, she's been doing this for at least a decade. I'm, I'm so impressed. Um, so Emily, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what your path to um, getting into audiobooks was? Sure. Um, yeah, I started doing audiobooks in 2009. So I think we're on, we're actually into year 14 now. Um, <laughs> yay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I had been a dancer singer who moved into acting on stage, um, since I could walk, uh, and had that background. And, um, after college where I studied dance and performance studies, um, and was also working in the theater department, um, on various shows and whatnot, um, I moved to Hong Kong. And while I was there, I was teaching dance and singing gigs and through the, um, the English speaking, I say immigrant community, um, they say expat community there, uh, mm -hmm. I got connected to um, an audition for dubbing and ended up getting doing dubbing there for um, a couple years. And then when I came back to the States, I knew that I wanted to continue doing dubbing uh, voiceover because I, I took to it like a fish to water. and was like, oh, this is like the merging of all of the things in one. Um, and, you know, you can make a living doing it, which is a huge incentive. Um, whereas the other things, it feels like you're paying to play all the time and, uh, got an audition through the acting network, um, for what was at the time, BBC audiobooks America. Um, and that was it. It was another thing that was kind of like, oh, I get this. All right, let's do it. You know? And then just kind of took off from there in 2012, I was it 2012 or 2011 one of those years I built my first home studio, which is to say I, my friend and I hung up, you know, <laughs> free insulation that we got that was probably terrible for our health in a closet <laughs> and, uh, you know, bought the, borrowed some money so we could buy some initial equipment. And, uh, but once I started it with the home studio, because it was at the right time and this is, it's different from what it is now, 10 years later, but mm -hmm. at the time it was, audiobooks were really just taking off. Um, and there was a lot of, um, there weren't a lot of people who could um, represent Asian cultures, um, East Asian in particular, um, but any, any Asian really. And I do speak Chinese and um, had a lot of, I grew up in Asian, in pan, a lot, mixed Asian uh, communities. And so that was kind of my entrance into the into the field and it took off from there. Couldn't you, you've done so many, uh, I mean, I, I think I counted 80, at least 80 titles. Could you- That's over just, 500. No way! <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. is amazing. You must never sleep, I think. Well, actually wow. that's something I can talk about because I've learned something about um, health mm -hmm. and how to take care of yourself when you're doing this particular kind of work. It's a new, a whole new thing. And I've talked to a lot of colleagues about it anyway. Uh, we can get into that later. And and can you just uh, give the listeners some ideas of some of the titles that they might have heard you in? 
Uh, I always say it depends on what you like because mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm lucky. I, I really, really am very lucky. I've, I've had a career that, um, and I guess I'm able to, to do multiple genres. So I've, I've done just about any genre there is out there. Um, so the most uh, probably best selling book I've ever done is the life changing magic of tidying up. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I also did, Gulp by Mary Roach, the Poppy War series, um, Dr. Afra, which is a Star Wars story. Um, you've done, gosh. you've done a, at least a couple of Melinda Lowe. Uh, yes, right? yes, right? yes. Last Which night at Telegraph Club, Huntress, Ash. Um, wow. yeah, and uh, some more uh, increasingly as it's as more people are becoming aware that I'm also queer because it's not something I forefronted, you mm-hmm. know, at in 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But I think as it become, it's becoming more well known, I'm getting more queer titles, which is awesome. Oh, and, yeah. and that I think is going to be something that's really interesting to see how how that shift happened, you know, sure. So that's definitely something we'll talk about. Yeah. Um, let's move on to the uh, Avi Roque, um, he, uh, oh. they, they, me. they, you got they, it. No yes. worries. <laughs> they um, first came on my radar when I was listening to Cemetery Boys, and I fell in love with their yeah. their narration. So I'm so excited to uh, see you in the flesh. So thank uh, you, what, James. Sure. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey? Sure. Um, so I'll just get all my labels out right right from the start. <laughs> um, I identify as uh, trans, trans masculine specifically, non-binary. Uh, so I do use the pronouns they, them, and queer as like the umbrella term for my sexuality. Um, I feel, la- oh, and Latine. So like I do have um, that cultural background. I feel like I'm theater-based. So I feel like I, acting the calling to want to transform and imagine and be someone else was always very enticing to me as a young person who was dealing with a lot of like internal like identity struggles questioning all of that stuff so i did find a home in doing theater and working on performance stuff so i did train in theater um Mm -hmm. And that took me into college doing, you know, that's, I didn't really dip into TV or film things and even try to break in because I, I haven't like broken <laughs> through just quite yet. Uh, but that didn't come until Chicago. So after college, I went to Chicago where I just did theater. That's what I wanted to do. It's what I loved. It was my passion. And then kind of got roped into like having an agent and getting sent out for TV, film, commercial things. And then voiceover was kind of this like other area that was not touched uh, for me. And this was all pre-transition. So I like to to name that as well. So this was before I began hormone replacement therapy, uh, which would be testosterone to masculinize my features, uh, which meant also my voice changed. Uh I tried voiceover before all of that before making all of those medical decisions for myself and nothing came out of it so like (laughs) i invested uh time and money into like taking classes for voiceover i paid a lot of money to create this like demo reel for voiceover uh but it just didn't it didn't take off in the way that i had anticipated or expected and i literally did give up so i was Mm -hmm. like all right i guess i don't have what it is for to be a part of this industry and that side of the world i'm going to leave that alone keep going to i'm just going to keep doing theater Mm -hmm. then i also was like oh wait i'm trans and then i was like what can i do (laughs) to feel better about myself uh to feel like myself to feel authentic to feel true and then that's when i did decide to medically transition and in that time frame I think my voice had already started to change and I get an email from Maddie <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, in my inbox being like, I'm a producer at the time, Maddie, you were at uh, Macmillan 
and you're like, I'm looking for a specific narrator for this book. It's called Cemetery Boys. Um, it features a trans Latinx uh, queer boy. Like, have you ever done audiobooks before? And I was like, no, I've never done audiobooks before, but I could audition for it. And plus, I was like, this story, like one of those moments of like, oh, that's me. Mm-hmm. And like to be able to tell that story, like, great, let me let me audition and I did and Maddie was like let me check in with the author Aidan Thomas and I got approved and that was my entryway into audiobooks and then with that other voiceover opportunities started to now come back into my life so it was like this full circle moment of I think it was always something I I was supposed to do or have do some in some way, some capacity. It was just about timing. And I think I needed to be good with myself too, Ah. in order for these opportunities to, uh, for everything to align. So once, once those opportunities came, did you, did it feel like, oh, this is something I want to pursue? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. Talk about like, yes, voice work. I feel like Mm -hmm is I feel the most like free and I feel like I get to bring my whole self Mm. into like, it's so funny. A lot of my notes as an actor in training was like, you're too much. It's too big. Like (laughs) stop. Uh Yeah. And, or like I'm pushing, it's not, it's not authentic. And, you know, so I think with voice acting, I feel like I have permission to kind of specifically with voiceover because audiobooks you're right are a little it's different but mm-hmm. i can still bring and infuse some kind of um um uh, character like some kind of something into it like the way i narrate is like i don't want to be just i don't know i have my style <laughs> <laughs> um and yeah so i think did i answer your question yeah. wow I went on and, the w- w- and what other so what are name some of the other titles that uh, sure so cemetery read. boys by aiden thomas i also narrated um uh, lost in the neverwoods which was also another aiden book thomas. of his yeah. i've uh-huh. done books for mark Bashiro. Um, the insiders which are like middle grade debut kind of middle grade novels um which uh, You Only Live Once, David Bravo, was one I just did. And yeah, a lot of YA stuff. That's like my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and queer trans POC rep through and through. So that's been the bulk of my work. And how long have you been d- doing it? Since like 2015, 20... right? No, 2020. Oh, 2020. Yeah, like I just started. I like Cemetery Boys. I think I recorded in 2020. And wow. since then, like literally, like it's just the floodgates have opened to where like now I'm in the mix. Now people know who Abi Roque is. And <laughs> let's That's have wonderful. them narrate this, um, which I appreciate and I love. But I still feel like I'm happy to do audiobooks, but I'm not making like a full living or career off of it. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's, I, I do a, a, a Disney channel show, uh, called the owl house, uh, and my voice rain whispers. That's been my like first animated thing. And that's where like, I've been like, I want more of this. Mm-hmm. I want more. I'm hungry for it. And I, I love it so much. Oh, and yeah. I think later we'll, let's talk about how, sure. how yeah. you juggle that kind of you know, the different projects and the different kinds of projects that must take a little bit of uh, doing. Yeah. All right. So let's, um, let's turn to the other side of the mic. We are so lucky to have two uh, audiobook producers from uh, Penguin Random House. And uh, so let's, uh, let's, let's, they also have a little bit of a, an overview presentation about about the audiobook world. So this is going to be really, really helpful for those of you kind of wanting to see, you know, how to start out. Um, let's start first with uh, Maddie. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself and, uh, and give us a little background about yourself? Uh, sure. Hi, I'm Maddie Argeropoulos. My pronouns are she, they, and <laughs> more of my identifiers are non-binary lesbian. I don't want to be queer. I love queer, <laughs> but it's so hard. It's so hard to like accept lesbian, but I feel like it's part of my Greek heritage. So it was just like, I'm not letting it go. 
It doesn't matter if I'm gender non-conforming. I'm keeping lesbian forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, actually, I didn't realize that Emily started in um, 2009. I started in 2010, so we're very close. But I started at the bottom. Now we're here. <laughs> I, um, I started in a, a music studio just getting coffee and doing like the copies and there were cds back then so right. there was like cd transfer and pick up the star and uh, fedex the scripts and the engineer script is missing and the whole thing has to yeah it was like a lot of drama in 2010 um but then <laughs> i learned how to be an engineer so i built up from being an engineer to qc person to editor to director to producer executive producer and now i'm at uh penguin random house and i've actually haven't been there um more more than a year it'll in november it'll be a year so for 12 13 12 years i've been working for all the houses as a freelancer and um, wow. at mcmillan for like four or five years so i've seen every iteration <laughs> of the publishing house everybody's styles all the producers i've got friends everywhere very few enemies but <laughs> i've been around <laughs> a long time um and my my general background it's it's literature it's uh, you know oh. it's you know uh i went to school for literature and while i was an engineer i went to school for art history so just for fun <laughs> <laughs> but um and yeah as a producer you work on about 100 to 125 titles a year so that'll give you a different number than what narrators are expected to work on. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I would say like maybe in the thousands by now. I mean, wow. like, but you wow. don't always get credit. You know that too. <laughs> I mean, if you engineer or direct certain projects, it's sort of a shared project. You don't always get the credit. So I would say like safely 500. No shade, Emily. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> it, was, it was definitely not reading, which I could never do. I could never do your parts, but safely produced 500. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's about, you know, a, a week's worth of Emily's time. So, um, <laughs> Maddie, uh, so you've had so many hats. Are there, is there one hat that you, that you feel a particular affinity for or? I, I mean, I do since it's something that let me distinguish myself i really do uh think that quality control was somewhere i could shine huh. and it was it's sort of uh it brought in your understanding of languages and research you know just going to graduate school is just like you can research the crap out of something and and uh but it's such a it's such a, a position that's not you know, it's not as well regarded. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, I can't just QC to pay my rent. And like, can you can but, you just uh, tell tell people what QC, you know, what, sure. what that it's, it's basically it's the person at the end of all of your hard work who goes through and nitpicks you and says, I hear I hear a mouth noise or you didn't pronounce that right. Or this pause is too long. <laughs> You know, I I didn't usually do that, but it was more like, uh, you know, this is a different character voice, you know, for example, you can get very detailed about it. Oh, but, uh, thank, there is there are people who you. do who have that role. <laughs> yes. No. And it's I mean, the idea of that versus doing your own recording at home where you have to be QC as well. It, yeah. it's, it makes you appreciate the people who actually do it. So oh, absolutely wonderful. Um, and let's uh, turn to Nithya. How are you today? I'm well, thanks yes. for having me. This is great. Oh, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, tell tell us a little bit about uh, what brought you here to audiobooks. Um, so I started in the music industry originally in college. So I worked for a bunch of major labels, and then um, I sort of transitioned to move, uh, moved into live sound, uh, doing some engineering at live venues all through New York City. Um, and that lifestyle was not working out for me too well. Uh, and um, I just knew some other engineers in town and was looking for a different opportunity, but did want to stay in the creative realm. And that led me to the sag After Foundation, where I ran the voiceover program in New York City for about five plus years, working with voice uh, talent from the union and uh, members who wanted to either break into voiceover or were already doing voiceover and just basically giving them the support system to launch their voiceover careers or restart it or uh, get them the footing um, in all areas of voiceover. But since I was New York based, uh, we had a lot of audiobook people, um, <clears throat> a lot of people looking to break into audiobooks 
or people who have been narrating for a long time and want to uh, keep fresh with trends and mm -hmm. uh, get some practice. Um, so that was what I had been doing. And uh, I've been working for Penguin now for about a year and a half, so I'm relatively new. Uh, but also bringing a lot of that voiceover talent from SAG AFTRA that I had met and a lot of what their concerns were, especially with people who are in marginalized communities and mm -hmm. uh, bringing them to Peng Penguin and talking to uh, the, the good folks over at Penguin um, and the leadership about uh, a lot of the things that were brought up by union members uh, regarding audiobooks, uh, getting cast, some of the challenges that they were facing and um, so yeah, that's that's what led me here. And by and large, is what would you say is the percentage of union work versus non-union work for audiobooks? Ooh, um, that's a good question, uh -huh. uh, Maddie. Do you know? If you yeah, I, I feel like I I don't want to say numbers, but I feel like the majority mm -hmm. is union. Would you say yeah. that? I think majority union. So, well, especially with the big houses, right? Correct. Yeah, well, Emily, can, can, I, have... can I jump in? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah, I would say that the majority of paid work is union. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's lots of uh, non-union options that you can do, like, say, right. through ACX, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. That would be royalty share only, and those are likely not to pay. They don't pay right. any up front, and then you have, and then you're, mm -hmm. yeah. And you're also doing all the work. Right. As well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we get into the work, though, let's... Uh, Maybe you can, uh, sh uh, Maddie and Nithya. Can yeah, can we throw share? up some bullet that points? Would be, that'd be great. Sure. Let me do a share screen if I can do it. Yes. All right. Can you see the screen? Yes. I okay. Can. So this is our uh, bullet point that our publicist puts together. Uh, so we publish uh, 2,400 audiobooks plus a year. We're heading to 3,000, hopefully within the next five to 10 years. Uh, we're, our catalog is 18,000. Uh, these are our stats. These are our bragging rights kind of thing. Uh, she listed 17 Grammy Awards, but that doesn't really list the nominations, which are a lot <laughs> and uh, are just as valuable as winning the trophy, in my opinion. Um, but this is just our general stats of everything. And what's the next slide she gave us? Oh, um, we can talk more about this later. Uh, I think Nithya wanted to talk about this a little bit when we talk about our mentorship. Uh, but that was just like the, the beginning part of like, this is who we are. Um, we do pay for our work. We're, we're not royalty based. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, we have a lot of quality books um, waiting to be narrated by all of you. So I can stop share and share again later. Okay. I can. There you go. Excellent. So, um, yes, and I, I do want to talk about AHAB because that's a relatively new uh, organization and it actually is very exciting. There's so much potential there. Um, but before we get there, I was just wanting to ask about, um, let me ask Emily, how, how different is the audiobook world now from then when you started? Um... Uh, in some ways it's very different and in others it's, you know, it's the same. It is a mm -hmm. big, it's, it's, it's bringing stories to life, right? It's putting, mm -hmm. putting writ the written word for specifically to be read with your eyes originally to, to audio form, um, which is a little bit different than performing stories uh, in the other voiceover senses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but as far as finding the work, getting the work, that's maybe... extremely different now. Yeah, and, with Ahab and, on the yeah. market and ACX existing and audiobooks in general just being more popular. Um, mm -hmm. Like Maddie was saying, we had CDs before, right? And CDs were both more expensive to produce and to purchase. Um, like I, I remember seeing audiobooks that were like sixty dollars you know, right. store because like, and if you got a book that was like 25 finished hours, right, that's, you're looking at a huge investment and printing them and like having to get the physical thing and then putting it in the car with the CD or whatever. Um, but with once everybody moved to, or a, a lot of people moved to having 
uh, devices that would play MP3s and cars that would also play MP3s and you could listen anywhere, anytime mm -hmm. very easily. That really helped to boost audiobook popularity. And we've that moved from manuscripts to iPads and APAC exploded, which we'll probably talk about what APA and APAC are. Um, yeah. Do you find yourself busier or more easily found? Uh, that has changed. I don't think that's a, that's as a matter of, um, as much a matter of the industry changing so much uh -huh. as just having been in the industry for as long as I have at this point. So that that's a right. little bit different in the beginning, as you would expect, it's a lot more networking. It's a lot more outreach. Mm -hmm. And then once you become more of a known quantity, um, casting directors, producers, know you and you know have a sense of who might be good for whatever titles and they they come to me mm -hmm. um which i'm very fortunate for mm -hmm. um and i am now at a point where i'm actually i've been trying to uh, having to um call the work so ah, nice. uh i got too busy for mm -hmm. too long and burned out <laughs> and um <clears throat> have had to say like, hey, no, you actually need a weekend or hey, mm -hmm. no, you can only work for this many hours in a day. So that means you can only actually say yes to so many projects, which is a real bummer because, you know, again, I'm very lucky. I get I get asked to do a lot of very interesting work and it always sucks to say no to work. <laughs> but um, but it, audiobook work is so time consuming. It's very it's it's not just time consuming. It's mm. energy consuming. Mm. Um, yeah. Right. So. Avi, because you have um, entered into the field more recently, how are you found? How how did you, I mean, like how, how did Maddie find you? Honestly, I think it was, I don't even know if this website exists anymore or <laughs> is still active, but it was called the Tea List. And it was like a database uh, that trans actors could just self-submit to. Mm. So... And I mean, because I was already an actor that was very visible as well. I think I do lead that way, like on, on many of my my social media platforms, like I am very out, very visible, like, so I think that helps too sometimes, but that's a personal preference because sometimes not everyone wants to be all like, and I'm this and I'm this and I'm this and I'm this, you know? So yeah, but that's how I was found, Maddie, right? That, yeah, that one was... of my authors, um, uh, uses use they them and still does today actually uh they them pronouns and they were like have you heard of this list and it's a community created uh database yeah. it's still live i still see people oh, it is? Like, okay it's not it's not oh, as uh it's not as populated as it used to be like a lot and so sure. it's sort of like plateaued a little bit but mm -hmm. yeah um I, we'll get to that later if you want but i i look for talent anywhere everywhere and Avi, you were not out there enough, but I did find uh -huh. you on that list. <laughs> I needed I, wasn't... I was just like, <laughs> but I found you and it worked out very well. There, there was. I was there. It was, it was early, early on. Now, uh, I, I agree. It was so, it was so early. Yeah. But, it was but Avi, early. do you now, do you, yes. are, do you have to hustle for the work? Does the work just come to you? How, how and that's, it? and that's what's in, so the work i'm getting majority is still because it meets a specific need and specific requirements um so because i feel like with the success of cemetery boys yes i think that's when other publishing houses and producers have been reaching out to me mm -hmm. to kind of facilitate or either audition or an offer or something like that so i think that's kind of how that this has grown for me is just literally from cemetery boys and that opening up the gateway for for other people to now know that i exist i see so it's like a, and that i can do it mouth. i can exactly right i, I think see. so i don't know <laughs> well well when we talk about gateway let's let's uh, yeah. talk to maddie and nithya as far as somebody is very interested in doing this how what should they do what's what's you know with some of the basic things that they need to know nithia you take it first sure um there's a lot of resources out there uh if you're already in voiceover and doing voice acting um you know there's so many different offshoots of of uh 
resources that you can find about audiobooks. Um, one of the first things you should really do is listen to audiobooks. It's as critical to listen to audiobooks and the medium that you want to get into. So I'd start listening immediately and really getting to know what the nuances are and what it re is required of, of doing this, uh, this, you know, this medium, um, for starters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the question is how to get into it at all. I think right. Just like what are so, um, like maybe you want to talk a little bit about the um, the member the uh, mentorship program. Oh or, yeah, sure. Or the sure. A, the a Ahab seems to be a really easy way to kind of plug in. So those sure. kind of things. Yeah. Um. The, I um. I'm on the committee for the APA, which is the Audio Publishers Association Mentorship um, Board. I don't know a lot of official words. Committee something but i was one of the founding members and um we created this mentorship program um it is for members but you can apply for a, a scholarship so you can be like you know sponsored or whatever to just participate in the mentorship and then if you find that you like the community and the resources then you can you know become a member yourself but it comes okay. with no obligation to be a member and um, it's three times a year and you're paired up with it. So it's open to diverse narrators. So it's just it's BIPOC, it's um, LG, LGBTQIA+, it's, you know, every kind of diverse background. It's, um, you know, and uh, neurodivergent. Neuro it's anything that, you know, like that isn't the just cis, white, straight uh, community that, you know, used to sort of read audiobooks mm -hmm. um, and you're paired up with uh, mentors who have a similar background to you and you're also asked how important it is to you that your mentor does represent your background so if you're like actually i don't really care i want somebody who has been doing this a long time and the identity and the other part is just like no actually it's really important to me that a black woman talks to me through this so we uh we pair you up with uh whoever you would like to be uh, mentored with. And um, it's very curated towards the mentee. You set your goals. You're like, I need somebody to help me like understand a home studio or whatever, or I don't know how to market myself. And you set your goals uh, with your mentor. And am I explaining this too much? <laughs> yeah, no, no, this is great. This is probably okay. what people, definitely what people need. <laughs> and, um, uh, it, and if your mentor is not giving you um, exactly what you're looking for they're also guest mentors there's check-ins with the um with the committee to see like oh it's not working out which we've had like 95 percent success rate and uh it's not just like beneficial to the mentees which of course you know that it's a free service and a ton of resources for you but the mentors have also reported like feeling really gratified by the experience because it can be a very isolating thing to just be a narrator solo just doing the work day after day and it sort of brings more sense of community and a continuity and a kind of like connection with other people from similar backgrounds let's say um mm -hmm. it's a great resource um apa.org i think and it's uh three times a year Oh, that's great. That's yeah. audiopub.org. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, and Nithya, <laughs> oh. if you want to talk about um, our internal one, I can bring up the slide. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go for it. <clears throat> cool. Um, so we started a mentorship program at Penguin Random House about two years ago. It started in uh, 2021. Um, so we're going into year three. Um, this mentorship program uh, lasts about six months. Uh, we just had the application deadline just a few weeks ago, but uh, we will be taking applications for next year for uh, 2024. Um, that said, uh, the mentorship program, you get paired with one of the producer staff um, and you work with them one on one. Um, your producer will take you through uh, some foundational things about uh, audiobooks. And similarly to the APA, we do bring a very diverse uh, group of mentees on board uh, as well. So uh, like Maddie was just saying, uh, this isn't your traditional cis white straight. Yeah, um, these are swat, pretty much every cloth of, of, of folk that you can imagine. Um, but the six month period, uh, you work one-on-one, -on -one, you meet about once a month. And uh, what we do is cultivate 
uh, what kind of audiobooks they might uh, excel at. We talk about what skill sets they can bring to the audiobook format. Uh, we talk about uh, subject matters that they think they'd be really great at and really just hone what kind of audiobook narrator they'd like to be, what kind of books they'd like to read, what mm -hmm. they will excel at. Um, and we also produce a demo at the end. So we work wow. on one, we direct. So all your producers wow. that you will work with uh, act as your directors as well. So you can be coached. Uh, you bring, uh, you know, different audiobooks. We work uh, collaboratively about what uh, you'd want on your demo, as mm -hmm. well as just, yeah, maybe being ready to audition and uh, honing honing those audition skills, as well as just the audiobook format and answering any other questions that they might you might have, whether it's business related things, um, a a networking kind of issues <clears throat> or uh, topics, just anything really. Um, so far, we've had 33 men, uh, mentees who've gone through the program and 91% of them have gone on to be hired by PRH and as well as other publishing houses. Wow. So, uh, you know, it's a pretty big success factor. And like we said, uh, it runs annually uh, and look out for the applications for 2024. Um, Nithya, let me ask you, though, why did Penguin Random House uh start this program? What, why is it important to, to reach out and, and find different voices? Well, you know, uh, stemming from, from uh, what had been mentioned earlier is, yeah, audiobooks and the books that are coming out are continually mm -hmm. changing. Um, we are seeing more and more diverse protagonists. We are seeing people mm. who are intersectional in every way and shape and form, and their voices need to be heard. They need to be, uh, you know, cast authentically as possible with Why? the author's vision. Why? Well, Why? Um, you know, it is all about authenticity and also being able to be equitable and, and do the right thing as far as casting. Um, you know, even though voiceover is done behind a microphone, uh, we are, uh, mm -hmm. it needs to be, you know, a person who has experienced something similar or can and speak to the topic and the matters at hand, whether it be uh, matters of race or matters mm -hmm. of sexuality or any of those things, uh, to be able to really bring the emotional core of what the author is trying to get across. Um, so, you know, in, sorry, I'm, I'm from down South, so I do a lot of sports references, but, um, <laughs> so forgive they'll, me. They'll go right over my head. Right <laughs> head. But I know, you know, it's, uh, it, it's sort of similar in terms of if you really want to speak about something, uh, mm -hmm. from an emotional core, you got to kind of do it. Um, you know, so having somebody who's never played basketball in their lives or, <sighs> To, you know, and, and suddenly being asked to uh, really understand what it takes uh, to play that certain uh, sport or whatever it is. But obviously we're talking about emotional things and really that's what it comes down to is being able to help the author's vision as well as, you know, whoever's listening, whoever is listening. You have swaths of listeners who mm -hmm. want to make sure that the narrator um is going to be able to deliver those stories and their, you know, um, and, and that those experiences in a way that they truly can feel uh, heard and, and just, you know, identify with. Mm -hmm. And Maddie, when we talk about the sector of like queer fiction, queer nonfiction, uh, how do you go about uh, finding uh, narrators that are that have maybe lived that experience, but at the same time, um, you don't want to. You know, uh, there are privacy issues. I'm sure you you can't just out. You know, ask people what their sexuality is, or you know that kind of thing. How so? How do you how do you find these people As, aside from the the mentorship program? I mean, I think. Um... By virtue, I think uh, it puts me at an advantage in comparison to other producers by virtue of being queer. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of queer actors sort of gravitate towards you. And, you know, like as I when I was an engineer, you would just, you know, start talking about your lives and your families and your girlfriends or whatever. And you sort of form a closeness uh. that way. 
So I would say that that's sort of a shorthand, but in general, um, everything, just like Nithya said, everything begins with the author. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes the author already has in their mind who they would like us to pursue. So maybe they know something we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, you know, that's, you know, it's back and forth. And sometimes it's a, um, it's a, 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 it can be a checkmark list, right? And it's kind of clinical. And you're like, wait a second. Well, maybe my author doesn't necessarily care about each and every identifier. Let's, mm -hmm. let me talk to the author. Let me start by saying that. And like, I can give you an example. Um, I produced a book called uh, Man of War this year. Um, my author is trans. Um, he uses he, him pronouns. And uh, he was just like, I know uh, this actor, they use they, them pronouns, but they have the best Ohio from the town I'm from. And this is far more important to me that they represent my region. Right. And also, you know, they're, you know, gender nonconforming. So it's, uh, it's not as clear cut as you would think it is. It's not like, you know, I have a list or, you know, it's, it's more of a, I read the book. I think about, you know, what I already know. Mm -hmm. from my experience producing and then I look out and see like what else could I know and who's new and who who could do this you know because they're so experienced and also they're queer you know so it's it's a lot of factors to consider. Do you feel like it's um, important to be to to be out and to be oh you know kind of out there in order to have them find you or have you find them? I, I don't think I am out in, in a certain no, way. Oh, I mean, no, I meant the um, I meant the narrators. Oh, <laughs> do, no, do no. I, I think it's important for them to be out? Yes, in order for you to be able to find them. Like what? I, I, I don't think they need to be out, but I okay. do think if they want to be cast in this work, yes. then they need to um, then they need to put it somewhere. It needs to be either like I'd, I'd like to audition for LGBT books or it's like if you're not saying right away like this is who i am then you yes. have to sort of if we don't know each other then you can sell you can tell it to me in an email and it's not a, it's not on your website but you do have to make yourself known in that way or my author knows something about you or whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you don't need to be out but you need to be findable if you would like to do this particular genre of work i see and emily you had talked about a little bit about uh, how you you didn't put your queerness out front, and yet it kind of has found you. Can you talk a little bit about how that process went or how that happened? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't really know the details <laughs> because I don't know the inner workings of the published of Maddie's world, right? The who talks to whom. Um, but I as Maddie was saying, you know, it comes out in conversations. You you just kind of get to know people and um, then it, it adds producers then know a little bit more about you. And um, and I will also say, I know we're talking about identity and that is super yes. important, but the other thing, the also, as you get to know people in audiobooks, which is unique from other elements or other uh parts of the entertainment world, because you normally have so many people in between, you don't get to talk directly to the people who are hiring you. You do with audiobooks, right? So they really get to know you. And that and that's ah. there's pros and cons to that. Certainly. It's I think it's largely pros, but Maddie, I mean, you know, sometimes it can get it can get a little dicey sometimes because you're you don't have any protection is the other aspect, right? Anyway. Wait, 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 what do you mean by that? Don't have any protection? Uh an agent. An agent can speak for you, can handle a lot of the things on the actor side, right? Mm -hmm. On the producer side, the line between what is your personal life and what is your professional life can, depending, there's lots of personalities in the world, right? We're not necessarily, mm -hmm. and even if we get along with 99% of the people, we may not get along with 1%, but they're friends with, uh, it's a community, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. so you get your normal things that come up in a community. That's all I'm saying. Um, but as you get to know people, which is a beautiful thing for the most part, um, they also get a sense of not just your identity, but perhaps what you might be able to bring to life as a performer. So it's your, your range or your, your subjects of interest and your modalities of speaking, 
and mm -hmm. the accents that you can do, which you wouldn't necessarily, okay, accents and identity, maybe you put up on your website, right? Mm -hmm. But just, and your demo is going to be specific for whatever. But as you get to know somebody, there's just those little nuances that might trigger a producer's mind when they're reading a book that say like, oh yeah, I remember. I, I, you know, so-and-so was talking about this when we were at the Audis or whatever, and then there you go. I so, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, anyway, and, so with my yeah. fairness, uh, yeah, I yeah. think it, it was just about uh, being people getting to know me, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it is kind of like, yeah, it is a kind of a personality thing as well as yeah, it's a personality uh, an thing acumen too. of... That's of, right. I see. Yeah. And, and Avi, you had mentioned how most of your titles are specific in in their request. Mm -hmm. um, do you, how do you view that? Do you feel like you're being siloed or, or uh, is that, you know what I mean? What, how yeah. do you, what, how, what's your relationship with that? And I, I cause I, yeah. I think I can relate as well. Yeah. I mean, like first and foremost, I am so grateful that like these stories are being told and that I am being invited uh to tell these stories and be a part of the storytelling mm -hmm. um of a lot of these uh diverse more inclusive uh narratives i think though just like an as an actor in general i think i am still running up against the like being tokenized in some way of still being like the go-to for x y and z mm -hmm. um so yeah again it's like the the pros and cons of it all uh i think it's like i don't know how i don't even have the answer of how can i be seen beyond these uh facets of my identity which are very much a part of who i am and again mm -hmm. i want to be able to be uh given the opportunity to tell stories that include parts of my identity Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I would like love to have access or opportunity to do work beyond that sure. and tell. And there have been some things where I've done where it's like maybe the character is meant to be like a, a, a cis, a cis boy or a cis teen, you know, and that's OK. Yeah, I get it because I do have more of a masculine voice and I am comfortable just as an actor playing any role that is you know cis male uh, man boy anything like that it doesn't only have to be non-binary mm -hmm. uh but yeah so i don't know i feel like i'm grateful but also at the same time i'm like well how do i how do i see how how can i be seen beyond just those right telling those stories can right I, I, I mean i think yeah. we might be able to like help and suggest more resources and stuff like that and help you branch out. Great. But I remember the first time I was recording, Avi, I was just like, yeah. yeah, I know you're really grateful, but don't be too grateful. You do a lot yeah. for us too. You right. do a lot for our audience. You do a lot for our authors. Right. So you right. should always be thankful, but yes, you, you know, look for more. Absolutely. Of course, of course, of course. But yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with, with that. I think, yeah, the bulk of everything I'm getting, it's still in that YA realm. Right. And and I find that even in just regular voiceover, as far as, you know, animation and things, mm -hmm. even though I do get a lot of Asian um, mm -hmm. roles, it and when I was first starting out, I was very like, I'm not going to do an accent. You know, I'm not going to do this. But sure. over the years, I've come to appreciate that, um, that I that I'm grateful in a way sure. that there is this niche that I can fill yes. because it is such a competitive field voiceover. Yes. It's so rarefied that for me to even be able to have this little corner and work out from that is, mm -hmm. is a blessing, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, oh my gosh. We're, we're so, we're almost done with the hour. I wanted to talk to our narrators a little bit about, how you organize, um, like for instance, Emily, how, how do you, you were talking about how you kind of structure your days and your week to be able to accommodate this really arduous process. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what, why is it so arduous? Why, what, why do you have to take care of yourself? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> uh, you have to talk for however many hours you can handle in a day. And it's not just talking. You're also having to make micro decisions constantly about your performance and your choices. You're having to sometimes, let's say for a fantasy uh, or a sci-fi, carry voices that have a huge range. If you're a narrator like, like, like I am, not all narrators are like that. Um, Scott Brick famously, right, is, right. Uh, does not, a lot of the older school actors actually, it's, a little, it's an older school style to not do heavy character voices Characters. and such. Right. right. But um, I've always done it. It's always come very natural to me. I came from anime and it's a very popular, particularly with YA and with sci-fi fantasy to do that kind of thing. And I'm capable mm -hmm. of doing it. But it is taxing, right? To to do a little tiny voice, you know, your anime voices, <laughs> and then the big big robot guy or whatever. I can't do it because I was talking all day already. Uh. So like it reaches a point where you you can only do so much physically with the voice. There's also the fact that you're sitting for that long, and then you're also directing yourself. You're engineering yourself. Um, so it's just a lot of. Uh, both performance performance energy output and also pro like uh, production energy that's mm -hmm. going into it. So it's a mental exhaustion. And I think that sitting is very exhausting too. It's, it's hard mm -hmm. on your body. And I actually, it's not, don't just think that science backs that up. It's, it's bad for you. So balancing it out with making sure you're getting enough movement and enough blood flow, and then add to it also, you're talking about working from home which now people during the pandemic have gotten a sense of what that means. It's a challenge in both directions. Some people have a challenge getting themselves to work enough or like having the home demands take a forefront over overwork demands. And some people like myself mm -hmm. would overwork and would home would always go to the end. And so then work home became an office and I never, then I didn't have a place to, to wind down. Right. And you need a separation of work and home. I well, what, what percentage do you do in studio, say, now? lately? Lately, yeah, yeah, not very much at all anymore. Really? And is it your yeah. choice, or is it the, is it the the producer's choice? Um, I think it's largely producer's choice. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's just not as much that's happening. I mean, um, Penguin is a little bit of it is is truly an exception. Um, Why? For a lot of reasons, I mean, uh -huh. the, you know, the, the outreach, the mentorship program, the AHAB, the, um, they have the resources also to be able mm -hmm. to do this kind of thing. Um, uh, and they're, they are willing, they ha you have a director. Nobody else has a director anymore, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all. Like, <laughs> let me tell you, it is awesome. Now, directors for audiobooks aren't going to work you in the same way that a director for, say, a, an interactive or for an a, a, anime would. And especially if you have a little bit more experience, they're, they're going to really let you drive. But just having somebody there to show up with, oh. it, it just makes all the to perform for, right? right? It's not like, Oh, I, I won't work if nobody else will let me show up. It's, it's no, I have an incredible work ethic. It's that, in fact, I work too hard and then I burn out and then I can't show up or, you know, like, mm -hmm. or having somebody to bounce ideas off of before you get in there. Because otherwise, I mean, we're all actors. You get in your head, right? And you can get really stuck there. So right. it's really helpful to just have somebody that's just outside of this little globe that you can. Or, or just at the very least catch catch mistakes you might have made so you that don't is, have to that is what their primary job is right is it, catch mistakes yeah <laughs> it's so it's a, such a comfort to be had to have somebody there yes it's one task on the list of a hundred that you can just take off and so it's just so you stand a little bit lighter mm -hmm. yeah right. um but yeah and, so that's why i think you need to really take care mm -hmm. and avi um i know you're doing you're doing plays you're doing the animation stuff how does how does audio how do audio books fit in your world and how do you juggle that yeah um before theaters opened back up again 
I think yeah. like from this year, I think my average from January was like I was doing one audio book a month. <laughs> so I was able to like, and maybe there was some children's books peppered in one month or a shorter essay or a part in a book. But um, I that was easy to manage. Mm -hmm. And my personal preference is to be in a studio and to be working with a producer, director or someone that is, it is truly the, for me, feels like the best way of doing my work in my job. Mm -hmm. um, Cause then I can just focus on the story <laughs> and, and delivering that and doing that. But I know not everyone has that luxury. I turned a closet into a booth. Um, <laughs> so like there's not the best ventilation. So honestly, if I do record anything in that closet, I'm going to do something short. I'm uh, not going to do full length. I did one where I did everything. I was responsible for all of that stuff Emily was talking about. And I was like, never again. I am not. <laughs> Sorry. No. A lot of work. No. Oh, yeah. I mean, or like, I don't know if there's a way to like, I do include my agents um, to help facilitate uh, and just to help keep things organized. Um, and so I don't know. I was like, if I do, like, we might have to really discuss and negotiate a higher rate because I'm doing all of the jobs. <laughs> um, and it does take more time. It really does. But um, yeah, I would say like to record a, a YA book, it can take me like three to four days. Okay. And so. But that what happens was, if you have other jobs in this, this? is what this is where I'm going to start figuring things out. I am in a play right now. And so that's going to be my evenings, Tuesday through Friday, and my weekends are gone. I have two shows Saturday and two shows Sunday. Mm -hmm. I have gotten some like inquiries about audiobooks, but this is where I get to be kind of like aware of my time. I think I came back being like, cool, would love to do this. I'm not going to be able to do it in like the three to four days because I'm going to need to be doing shorter recording hours a day because yeah. I'm, it is exhausting. Emily's right. It's, it's draining. Um, and then I have to go and do more work on stage. <laughs> like it's going to be a, a, a little learning thing for me, but I already want to go into it thinking about these things mm -hmm. and trying to be cautious cautious and aware so I don't get that burnout because I know how that feels too. Right. I mean, yeah. uh, emotional, but also just physical burnout, you know? Definitely. It is. It's so weird. It's like, well, it's all connected. Mental exhaustion yeah. is like affects the body. <laughs> and so, so, right. Like you, you start, thing. you start out as a narrator, as a young high school student. Yeah. And by the end, you sound like, you know, your grandma, <laughs> Joseph, you know? Well, so. it, yes. The voice, it's a muscle. It's going to get tired. Yeah. And and that will affect the quality of your performance sometimes, which is why taking care of your body and, and your voice is, is very important. Yeah. Um, we are about to um, take some questions from the listeners, um, but do any of you have anything else that you kind of wanted to put out there or? Uh, I, I think advice? we should talk about Ahab. Really fast? Oh, please, please do. It's great. Nithya, do you want to give the spiel and I'll do the slide? Yeah, sure. That Thank you. Um, so Ahab uh, Casting uh, is a platform that Penguin started a few years ago internally for our in-house producers to use to find new talent. But now, uh, uh, since 2021, it has been opened up to anybody and everybody, all publishing houses, as well as any content creators that are looking for unique, diverse, specific voice talent. Um, so even though it is still primarily in the audiobook lane, if you have a you know commercial demo you want to throw on there or an animation demo, please feel free. But like I said, it is primarily used um, in the audiobook realm. Uh, but that is uh, expanding, of course. Um, Ahab is free to use. It's free to sign up. Uh, it's super user friendly. Very um, easy. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we made it uh, as as user friendly as possible. The interface is really easy to navigate around and um, you can, like I said, you can upload uh, multiple different samples, but it also gives a, a, you an opportunity to tell people and producers and other content creators about yourself. 
Um, oh yeah, thanks. Ah, thanks. Yeah, we know, yeah, we know that. this person. <laughs> so here's Avi's <laughs> Ahab profile. Um, I think you need to update your samples, Avi. <laughs> <laughs> But the busted. bio is great. This is busted. what we're looking for. But go ahead, Nithya. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, no, no. Just um, using Amis as a an example. They, uh, you know, have provided their website. Um, uh, has talked about their gender, cultural background, age range, um, a little bit of a biography, and some general knowledge. Uh, this is a really good snapshot for us mm -hmm. to get an idea of who you are as a person, what kind of work you'd like to do. And so you can really, um, you know, uh, basically give us an idea of, of who you are, what kind of work you'd like to do, what kind of work you've already done. And, uh, you know, and just talk about your, your acting experience, um, and all the all the things you want us to know about you, uh, you know, this is a place where we can, like you said, invite to audition if there's a sample that we really like or if there's something or if there's a book that I'm specifically working on. Um, I've done a lot of rom coms where the uh, pro tags have been, uh, you know, queer BIPOC folks. Um, so I'm specifically looking for that. And if I listen to. Uh, a sample and think, all right, this person might make a really great fit. I will invite them to audition. Uh, so you will be, uh, you know, working with the director or, or, or a producer directly one on one um, or one of our staff uh, who works with us, too. Um, so, you know, we do work very collaboratively and uh, yeah, it's free, um, free free totally free yeah it's it's free and more than that it used to be an internal database for just right. prh and um many indie houses and many independent producers have access and they um are also casting and auditioning you so it's not just for us yep um, avi i think you should put a couple of earphone awards in here too i think <laughs> i don't i don't have any of those no i thought do we i I'll look at <laughs> You should I'm find not. out those. You, can you should to highlight those. <laughs> no one tells me anything. I feel so like whatever. I'm on connected. Disney. Are you on the audio know. file email list? This is for everybody. Are you I'm on actually, audio files email list? I'm not, Emily. Send me the link. You got to do it. All right. This is a resource. We got resources for you. Yeah, they send out it every Thursday. They send out an email with reviews and okay. you can see. And then every month or no, bi-monthly. They have a magazine, a print magazine. I know <laughs> the age of dinosaurs. Um, I love it though. Uh, where they, you can see all the reviews that they've done for the last couple of months and they will tell you what who's gotten in your phones and mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, that's audio that. files yeah. magazine. Audio file magazine. Yeah. Okay. Audio file with an F. Yeah. Right. See, that's been the funny thing being so new to the audiobook world. I feel like I'm doing a lot of learning by of by course. doing yes. and it's just like you're right because it's like where are the resources sometimes it's challenging to be like this is where i go yeah mm -hmm. you know but that's why this is so i'm glad where this is happening good yeah, <laughs> yeah. and another place that is going back to in person is the apa um mm -hmm. if you want to be a member of that you can pay for a membership and then go to their various events that they have throughout the year. The largest, the biggest one being the Audis, which this year is happening at the end of March. Um, yeah, and the most businessy one being the APAC. And that's, that's like, right. the, that's where you expand your resources and you meet everybody. So Ugh. if you just want to party, you can go to the Audis. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, does this but mean it is, I need to network? I have to network. Yeah, yeah that oh. is networking. And it is important to know that the AP, APA is a little, um, singular in that it is for the publishers it is not a narrator's event and ah. it's changing they're starting because narrators over the past 10 years have really uh there's been a, a huge growth um but it's for the publishers um and so if you go there as a narrator it's not and if you're coming from hollywood and you're coming from other aspects of the entertainment industry don't treat it that way because it's it's gross we don't like it <laughs> audiobook <laughs> people i'm just gonna be perfectly frank audiobook okay. people are very down to earth they're very real we're we're book people you know mm -hmm. and it's the publishing industry it's not the entertainment industry it's the publishing industry who's bringing in people from the entertainment industry it's not the entertainment industry trying to do some books you know what i mean 
So yeah, and, and bit, just yeah. um, to that point that the APA is for publishers and all publishers, um, do you want to talk about PANA or narrator-based organizations or resources? PANA is new. Uh, I don't know that much, honestly. Um, I was asked to be part of the board, but did not have the time to commit to that. Um, but that's Professional Audiobook Narrators Association. Oh. Didn't um, so you can and look they that have, up. They, they're on social media, so if you want to get yeah. any information from them p-a-n-a -A. yes yes p-a-n-a -A. yeah um i wanted to throw in a pitch if you're looking to hone your skills and also do some philanthropic good for the world there is an organization called learningally.com or dot org um, oh yeah they we used promote to be... learning ally all the time for sure yeah. it's 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 a great organization it used to be called um reading for the blind and then it was reading for the dyslexic and blind and now they're calling it learning ally but um it's a volunteer organization and uh they pair you with titles um and you can if if you you have to have a setup at home but it's great it's a great way for you to kind of hone your chops and also to realize like oh i like this or this is too much for me so learningally.org is a, is a great place all right, let's uh, let's turn to some questions. Let's see. Producers, which is more important to cultivate, range, or to find the specific genre you're drawn to? What do you listen for in a good sample? I'll start. Um, I'm not going to directly answer the question. I want to say about genre is that I want you to give yourself a chance because just because you enjoy reading a genre does not necessarily mean that that's the genre people hear from your voice or that you would be the most successful at. Thank you for nodding, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I would encourage you to listen to and practice a lot of genres. I mean, not every single thing, but maybe about five solid genres that you wanna experiment with, but I, I wouldn't nail yourself down to one until you start hearing feedback until you start listening to yourself. Um, so I, I would say keep uh, keep your ideas open about what kind of uh, reader you are. Mm -hmm. And what do you listen for uh, in, in a good sample? Um, sort of uh, committing to the text, really feeling like I want to keep listening, um, that my ear has been grabbed and uh, that it's compelling storytelling, even if it's nonfiction. I just truly just want to hear where it's going. Um, and a lot of that is delivered uh, in a very nuanced way. You know, it's the pauses. It's, uh, you know, where they choose to to the lilts that go up and down. It's little things like that that you'll cultivate uh, the more and more you do it. But for me, um, mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, that person killed that Scottish accent. Um, no, that's, a, that's great. That's awesome. But really, it's about keeping my ears engaged and feeling, you know, if I, at the end of the sample, want to go, I want to hear the rest of that. Mm -hmm. I want to hear the rest of that book. I want to listen to it. I need to hear what happened to that character or uh, what's going on. Um, but for me, it's more of keeping my ears really engaged. What takes you out of of uh, listening to a sample? What what just jars you and and kind of uh, you know should be avoided? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, on a basic level, you know, you don't want a fire engine going by or something like that. Um, <laughs> you, know, you want you want to provide the cleanest sample as you can. But um, yeah, people who uh, their pacing is jerky. Uh, sure. There is no consistency to uh, how they're enunciating or too many pauses or not not like uh or people who are just reading rather than being engaged with the text and you just feel like you're listening to a one long run-on sentence uh things uh, like that yeah and i think mythia is being really like specific and like you mm -hmm. know eloquent about it but sometimes it's just a subjective feeling you're like i don't know how to describe this i love this and the author can come back to you with the same thing where it's completely subjective that you're like, this is my favorite narrator ever. Like, why would you? And it's just like, I don't know. I just like this. And mm -hmm. it can be something that you cannot describe. And sometimes if it's a bad sample, you also cannot describe that either. We're just, <laughs> like, 
where where you're just like this isn't this isn't it it's not this is not the book i've read the book and i don't hear this you know how much um author how much is the author uh, figure in the selection process i i think the author is a huge collaborator for producers uh, we can also blame them for mistakes. <laughs> Not that I ever would. I'm so glad you're here, James, as an author. Uh, I wish uh, I wish you had been like allowed to approve an audition or something like that. But um, yeah, the author is is definitely uh, the starting point for us. It's uh, author care. It's author consultation, even if it's not in their contracts, which I'm sure is very boring to talk about. But it's just you. You there's always a check in. Mm -hmm. Oh no, for me, like they, I had a choice of maybe two or three narrators. I listened to them, but I definitely listened to the producer. They would kind of, well, you know, this seems to be better for this. That's better for that. But yeah, um, I did have some input. Don't worry. Um, okay, actors, how much research do you like to do or are expected to do for roles? like historical fiction or properties like Star Wars in which there's a whole, you know, world. What what kind of um, research do you guys do? I think it really depends. It really, really depends. And it also depends on the publisher. So there's, um, there's research in terms of uh, uh, context and and knowing about the subject con context, context and content and mm -hmm. then there's research for specific words like pronunciations right um, depending on the volume of them uh, and on the publishing house sometimes you can get a lot of support from the publishers and sometimes you get none um, some, so it's, sometimes it's entirely on you it's good to check that as early as you possibly can um, Often with uh, books in the sci-fi fantasy realm, there's where there are a lot of made up words. Those are words that you can, you, you as a narrator are generally responsible for compiling a list and then sending that to the publisher, ideally with a couple of weeks notice so that they, there's time for the author to get back to you before you start recording. Um, yeah, for, for pronunciation of certain things. Sorry, the bug on my back. Uh, yeah, but in terms of like content research, um, I, my personal perspective, um, is that my job is to deliver what's in the text and the author has chosen to include or not include whatever for a reason. And so I'm looking at what is in this specific text and the world that they've created, um, and honoring that. So uh, I don't really feel like I need to do a ton of background work mm -hmm. um, to, to figure it out. That's also coupled with the fact that a producer is, these producers are generally doing really good jobs and casting well, right? So it's not like, whoa, this is way out of my wheelhouse, right? You're generally cast for something that you're gonna be appropriate for. Mm -hmm. So, How and it has happened once or twice where it's not been the case. And I've, that was early on. But I emailed back and was like, hey, I really can't do a South African accent. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and the protagonist, I mean, this entire thing is written in a South. I can't, I can't do it. I'm sorry. I could do a line or two here or there. I can't carry the whole book. Um, you know, something like that. Um, How much notation do you typically do to your text? Um, at this point, none. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I find it to be way too crowding. Um, but I can understand how early on, if you're prepping, you you might want to do that um, early on in your career, I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, I do, when you read through, you do take note of characters and, mm -hmm. you know, if there's any particularly uh, in, uh, different kind of section, like it, all of a sudden it goes into a, a six page email or something and it's written in code. I don't know, you know, like something strange can come up like that. It's good mm -hmm. to know about that ahead of time. It definitely mm -hmm. prep, absolutely prep, but I don't notate on the thing. I, I like to have the freedom to make the choice when I'm in the moment. I see. And what about you, Avi? Yeah. What kind of prep uh, do you? Well said. 
Um, I agree also with like, I make it an effort to uh, read prep, read beforehand if I have the time, which I was having the time when I was just focusing on like a book a month. So to have an idea of like, I know what the story is. And yes, early on in my first couple of books, I was, uh, I annotate is what Maddie like shared with me. So I put, I have my iPad. So I put all my um, manuscripts on there. And I was also making note of characters, which I still do. Like if I am the sole narrator, then I like to have that. And I was going extra with like, with that, like I wanted to feel prepared. So yeah. what I was doing was I was deciding on a voice <laughs> um, beforehand and I would record them for myself. I re-record any words in my voice that I know I need to be pronounced a certain way, just as like reference for myself. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think as I'm getting more comfortable, it's like the training wheels can start to kind of come off. But I feel like I'm still kind of, I'm still kind of there a little bit of like, I want to still have that support um, going into it. So I feel prepared. Sure. Right. Right. And that makes sense. I mean, it, and it's sometimes it's important to notate just a shorthand for yourself of like totally. this character because this character is going to be speaking to this character so yes you want to make sure that this one has a different tone than that one yes right yeah i well, treat it like a script honestly i highlight so i give every character a color <laughs> so, oh, kind of, wow. and so and that's how yeah. i kind of I, I do sorry i cut you off and then... no you're good you're good um, I just want to throw in that there, uh, there are lots of people and programs for coaching. This, these are very, very strong coaching questions. Um, myself included, I do private coaching, oh, but there are programs right. that do, that can help you with these kinds of things to hone your process and to, to figure out what, where to put your energy toward, uh, getting better at and what you're, what you're already strong at and things like that coach. It's very useful. I think. Wait. So when you're saying programs, do you you don't mean applications? You mean like classes? I mean like classes. Yeah, like okay. you can a series of classes that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and I for for this group, I'm I'm happy to open myself up to if somebody wanted to email me and say, uh, just hey, I looked up this program. What do you think about that? Do you think it's a good one to sign up for? I'm happy to say. To give you my opinion, because I got lots of them, <laughs> but I, I'll say like, yeah, yeah, these people are legit. I, I've known them for a long time. Or no, these people don't know what they're talking about. Please don't sign up for that. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm happy to be a resource for that. Oh, and speaking of resources, I would like to put in a plug for um, on YouTube Ahab the Ahab Symposium. Is that what it's called? They have I think such so. It, have, there's a lot of videos. Yes, a lot of videos, but very a lot of them are very nuts and boltsy. Yeah, about, they're great. Yeah, they're they're wonderful. You you meet a lot of different narrators who talk about their processes, and um, you could really learn a lot just from watching those YouTube videos. Um, all right, producers, what can actors work on to be a good candidate for the mentor programs? Um, and I think we might have mentioned this before, but are there other PRH or APA resources we can utilize if not yet accepted? Yeah, I think uh, our team at PRH is working on a resource list um, for if your application is rejected the first time. So look out for that coming up. Um, and what was the first part of the, the question is, uh, oh, what can they do to get accepted? Or to be right, a good candidate. What, a what good are you candidate. I, I think uh, just keep working, keep listening to audiobooks. And I think there, there might be a like zero to five audiobooks narrated. There might be a, like uh, the application might ask that you have done a little bit of voiceover work in the first place. Mm -hmm. So uh, keep working on your samples, keep working on being uh, visible in whatever way you can be and uh, findable. But um, yeah, I would say, to, to understand the medium, to, to listen. And you don't have to like get an Audible subscription or whatever. We have like library, I listen to all my audiobooks from the library app, like, so just listen to uh, your own voice and listen to, uh, if you don't know where to start, just, I mean, even audio files, just like top 10 audiobooks of the year or whatever, or, you know, like 
see why they're popular, see why they've won these awards. It's a good place mm -hmm. to start. Um, I hesitate to bring this forward and I don't know how everyone feels about it, but there is this um, audio marketplace called ACX, which is run by Amazon. And it's kind of like the Uber of audiobooks, in which, in which case they're really kind of just the broker between projects, book projects, and narrators. So you could throw in, you know, uh, audition for anything. Um, it's really dicey sometimes because you don't really get paid or you get paid, like Emily said, on a, on a kind of a, um, what is it? Uh, like a royalty share, a royalty. royalty share, which often is nothing. Right. So it's not, you're not going to, um, you're not going to be working. Maybe you're going to be doing all of the work yourself. You're going to have to do the, 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 um, recording. You're going to have to do the EQ on it. You're going to have to do the QC on it. Um, but it's just, it is a free thing to be able to enroll in where, you know, a, a little bit like Ahab, but in a more wild west kind of format. Yeah, I, I would say ACX. I know I have actually done several programs or projects through ACX that have paid and where the books are good. And um, so it's not, it is the wild west for sure, but it's not all unpaid work okay. at all. Um, I would say I would see it more as like an equivalent to voices.com or voice one, two, three or something like that, um, where it's it is it's just kind of open to everybody. But mm -hmm. if you it's a great place to practice auditioning. Right. It's a great exactly. place to look at uh, what what books are being independently produced. Um, if you want to get your feet wet and do one book that for free, you know, see what that feels like. That's, I, I feel like that's okay. Um, I, because I'm sure that that experience is gonna turn you away from ever doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are really well-established narrators who I'm like, what are you doing next week? And they're like, I'm doing a book for ACX. So it's not like, you know, yeah, yeah, people they're... haven't found their way around. And I are they published on Audible too? So it is a way- Yes. yes. It is a way to get your Audible sample, which is a, a big way that many producers find you and they can track if you have experience because it's sold on, ad on Audible, excuse me. So right. that is another plus for it. Right, right. Or if you're working with an author who um, is, is independently produced and doesn't know anything about audiobooks, ACX is a place where you can go and say, if you're if you're willing and able to do the full production, which I think if you're just getting into audiobooks, maybe is not quite the bag. But um, for somebody who's like myself, who's been around for a long time, I will use that when I'm producing a book. An author will come to me and say, "Hey, I I need to oh. make an audiobook. I don't know how to do that." And I'll say, "Okay, I know people. Like I can put together a team for you and QC and all the things. I'll produce it. And mm -hmm. then if you want to, you can use ACX just to upload your book to Audible." Right. So it's a, it's available in, in that sense, too. But so when you yeah. did titles for them, was that earlier in your career, later in your career? No, I just just the other day. It was like a couple months ago. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there is a really steep learning curve with them as far as having to learn how to engineer. You get so, no guidance. There is no. zero guidance there. Um, and, yet, and it shows it, yeah. in, in some of the books that are produced from HCX. Um, <laughs> and you take a listen to it, it, uh, it sounds not great. Right. And, and there are tons of um, YouTube videos about it and, and, and things like that. But it really, it does take a lot of technical savvy to be able to kind of navigate through that world. So Can I say one more free resource yeah. would be like Clubhouse events? There's a lot of like narration um, communities sort of like audition for me or whatever. And they just meet and trade ideas and talk to each other on Clubhouse. And that's pretty steady. There's like a, a usual Sunday night get together on Clubhouse. Or I think Monday morning might be like for romance <laughs> where they audition like uh, <laughs> romance uh, pieces from text or whatever it's a really good community it doesn't cost anything and you just talk to other narrators on clubhouse and um we even do um an ahab thing on on club right nithya we um 
like yeah, a couple the, of pre- what is it called the ahab uh, workout uh, maybe something like uh, that or they yeah. they'll bring on a few producers and there'll be a topic like the topic is self-care and get out of the booth or something like that and you can you know talk to the audience as well as like the guests that you've invited on so clubhouse is a good resource for audiobooks as well I, i'm old so clubhouse is like a social media kind it's of an thing, app or? it's audio only <laughs> okay. it's audio only so you're just phoning in like i think there was like a phone oh. in, like, yeah like a party line <laughs> and is it club clubhouse.com or no it's an app oh yeah, the app okay yeah. so you yeah have oh, they opened it up it used to be invite only right and only for apple users i mean i'm sure oh. we all know i mean Someone. At this point, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I, think, I don't no, know if it's, it's, it's open Samsung. to everybody. It's open now. It's, yeah, like it's open to everybody. It's free. Yeah, and the great thing is you can be a fly on the wall with that, so yeah. you don't you don't really have to participate have to, at all. Um, you can just you can learn, just listen in on these conversations. Right. Yeah. There are some also narrators who um, a handful. I don't think it's very many, but on Discord, who like will show will record themselves while they're narrating so you can kind of sit in on that process and just mm. watch um yeah and and if you're going to bring up discord then there's like a really funny tiktoks uh <laughs> done by by narrators in the booth so there's a, a a tiktok community of audiobook narrators too yeah yeah i don't know how everybody has time for all this stuff <laughs> <laughs> like how do you make these videos and do all these things I've I just... got bread to bake. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have time for that. I gotta go to the gym. I, <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't have time. Oh man. Um, all right. The, here's a one more question for everyone. Uh, in an effort to build a sustainable career, how can an actor break out of being pigeonholed as, uh, as able to be only a trans narrator or a trans Latina? How can we be considered for less specific or cis slash straight slash white roles, especially when we can believably portray that. Can I start and everybody else can go, please? Sure. Yeah. Um, get to know your producers. Mm. Uh, create relationships with your producers, your directors, and let them know that this is uh, a, something that you're interested in doing. Some of us are just like, oh, you're you're the greatest like Latina I've ever heard. I'm going to kick you every single and she could have been like i want to do like irish mysteries or whatever you have to talk to us tell us oh. put it put it on your bios but i know it's it's harder when it's just the blanket of please hire me for this but it ha in audiobooks it is one-on-one -on -one. it is the people you have to tell us one-on-one -on -one. and sometimes more than once <laughs> but uh i would start with uh talk to your producer okay avi <laughs> Yeah, good to know. Um, <laughs> um, no, totally. Yeah, I don't know. I think I, I can see I can see it like both ways of like how it, the onus or the responsibility is on the individual as the actor, but also it's on our producers, casting directors to also get out and and um, yes, see beyond, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, but like to Maddie's point, I think that's so fascinating that it's just like it, it it's still a voice. So it's still kind of like like where is your voice going to fit in a story? Um, but yeah, I don't know. I just think in general, it is a, it's a, it's a casting thing too, of just not, not getting stuck yourself when you're looking for narrators um, for any kind of project, I guess, but also the individual to, to be a little more proactive. And uh, what is it? Closed mouths don't get fed. Is that the that's the, that's the phrase, right? Is that a bad phrase to say, or is, is that I don't know where where the Sounds origin of that came from? Now I'm now I'm nervous and now I'm stressed. No, okay. I love that. Is it I like part that. of like the the loudest mouth gets the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease? <laughs> well, I think I, I think what it is is like to like advocate for yourself and to like and speak up and 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 say you know hey. I'm, I'm interested in doing that. So I think that's good advice, Maddie, is to like, there's a relationship there, foster the relationship, build the relationship. Um, yeah. And just speaking for us producers, we are pushing for outside of the typical There box. you go. 
we there are pushing go. for a uh, wise history always read by white guys or whatever. So we are hmm, pushing for sure. those things as well. And if you let us know that you want to push with us, there you then, go. Uh, we'll include you in that. I think that's yeah. what I'm discovering. Oh no, go, go. Yeah. No, just, I'm, I'm just jumping on the bandwagon. Like, go. It's, it's hard to articulate just how special this moment in history is in, mm. in audiobooks. It is one of the only industries that continued to grow during the pandemic, right? So not only is it a place where actors can get more work, but it's because the producers are so hip and have a, the power to, to cast and we're directly connected to them. It's this just unique place in history where like we have a chance to just now just like make some mm. changes, right? That's why Ahab exists. That's, that's why it's because it's, they needed more people and needed more voices, right? Us old Barts were like, there's only so many of us to go around and we all get busy and we need more. We need more <laughs> of these other voices, right? Like Vikas Adam and I were like the only two Asian and queer people that existed 10 years ago. <laughs> it was like, okay, great. Good for us. But like, we can't do all of it. We're not, we shouldn't do all of it. It's not for just, you know, it's, we, we need more people and the, the producers have the power to, to make those changes. And they are the, the connecting point between the publishers, the traditional print publishers and those actors, right? So Avia, to your, what you were saying, it is a change that everybody needs to make, but the producers are in, a, are in an engine position right? They're really drivers. And so, yeah, it's, it's awesome to be able to directly connect and to lend power to that with our voices. Uh, just to um, follow up. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Nithya. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to add, um, you know, another way uh, to convey to all of us that you want to be open to every and all kinds of work um, is to put some samples up there. So even if you have booked work that um, shows your queerness and our LGBTQ uh, roles, throw a sample on there that's some nonfiction book about physics. I mean, whatever it might be uh, to just, you know, even if it's something that you haven't booked, those samples can be from anything. Um, and it's just showcasing, uh, you know, the range of stuff that you can do. So feel free to throw something on there that's, you know, I don't know, a cowboy book or something. I, I, I just, but whatever it is, whatever it is. Uh, but yeah. And um, Emily, did you, would you say that your entry point into audiobooks was through Asian narrator titles? A hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. The first book that I ever did was a, uh, a um, murder mystery written by a British Chinese woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what connected me to Tantor from there was because they needed somebody who was Chinese and who could speak Chinese and uh -huh. they couldn't find anybody. So they were asking around saying, Hey, who do you know who can do this? And then BBC said, yeah, well, you know, we've got this one. She, she did a good job with these ones. So, you know, talk to her. And it just, it went like that. <laughs> but then you were able to though, expand your uh the kind of books that you that you read and yeah that, yeah that and just i think through connection i think or? that's probably a function of a lot of things i can't pretend to know how the universe works but well, um you have part of voice, that you know thank you <laughs> part of part of that sure is talent part of that is skill sure um part of it was just i don't know timing i guess and where i was coming in um and also I'm mixed race, right? Mm. So it wasn't hard for somebody to say, oh, she could also do somebody who's white. Now, I have done very, very few books that have been a white protagonist. Most of oh. the ones that I have done have been Chinese really? um, or Asian. Um, yeah, and that actually works with my identity because I, I grew up as a Chinese American um, and that's where I mostly identify, mm -hmm. but I'm technically half and half. So if you want to just look at the, the, the blood ratio, whatever's right. This is, this is a really interesting subject of identity, right. And like, and representation, because especially for those of us who are intersecting in a, in a lot of different ways, um, where technically I'm half. So 
you know mm -hmm. i don't know I, I don't actually know why and how i just know that chinese and specific specifically chinese but asian and especially east asian mm -hmm. um books were my my way in and the reason i was doing a lot of different genres was because east asian is not a genre <laughs> right <laughs> so you have you have Asian YA, you have business books, you have history, you have academia, you have self help, you have that just happened to have been written by somebody who was female and Asian. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then you start getting the queer Asian female. Um, and I don't know if they knew when they first started casting me for that, it might have just been, hey, you're the Asian female. <laughs> yeah, you've done this one, you can do YA, right? Yeah, but um, yeah. Uh for the producers, if there's somebody out there who says, oh, I, my voice doesn't sound like the typical narrator voice. I, I, it's too idiosyncratic. Do you have anything to say to that? Is there a narrator voice? You nah. mean like the pitch of it or something? Or? You know, it's no. not, I don't sound like Scott Brick or I don't know. No, you know. there is no, there's, there are thin voices, no. there are deep voices, there are a range of voices. There, yeah. mm -hmm. there is no typical voice. There's, you know, we're not Ira Glass or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Who's actually has a very different voice and like, so <laughs> there, there is no, no typical voice. It, it depends on, sometimes a, a genre will box you in. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the YA voice is a little specific sometimes, huh. uh, but, but that's, that's not true anymore. I don't think, I think it's a mixture. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. There's so many stories and so much content out there that your voice will fit the character or the book, not vice versa. So, yeah, I would work on the storytelling rather than like, I'm cursed at birth or what. So just, yeah, that's why being told you have a good voice says nothing about whether or not you can do voiceover and anytime. how many times have we heard i've always been told i have such a good voice can i just do <laughs> if so i had easy. a penny yeah <laughs> okay so uh, let's do the last question and um to kind of wrap up here's a, a new voiceover actor they've taken some classes they love audiobooks um maybe we can just go around and what's your one or two pieces of advice that you would give to this person? Um, who wants to start? I can start because it's really basic. Um, I would say uh, I know that every at least top five publisher has an internal database. Ask to get on their roster. Ask to get on uh, ask to just can I give you my name email. They have a form Harper Hachette Macmillan, um, obviously us at PRH Simon, like they all have an internal database asked to be put into that database and be really specific about who you are and what you'd like to read. Um, and uh, in general, uh, study the medium. I'm sorry if that's your answer, Nithya, by the way. <laughs> you, no, I think I said you. that earlier. I think I said that at the top. Yeah. I kind of jumped ahead of myself. And, yeah, listen, listen, it's listen, a listen. really it's a really good point because we face a lot of snobbery when it comes to audiobooks and that um, actors can be a little aloof about it. Oh, I read real books. It's just like that's that's not the attitude anymore. So uh, we'll we'll notice if you're a, a snob about our own work. So try try to see i mean even now like a, a narrator who's been i've been working with for years uh is just like i finally started listening to them <laughs> you know like they're really good i'm like i know we're not like you know wasting our time here <laughs> <laughs> anyway sorry that's that's right. what I'll, I'll say i guess i'll jump in okay um because i you you made me think of something maddie where there there is a lot of snobbery from the publishing side about like what is really reading and what is really getting a story um but to that point just so everybody knows spread the word right the same part of your brain gets lit up whether you're listening or you're using your eyes right and retention can be better when you're listening versus when you're reading with your eyes because you're especially if you have a good narrator who's bringing forward 
a lot of the ideas that may, uh, or the motive aspects that you may not get when you're reading with your eyes. But there's also some snobbery from the entertainment side. Audiobooks, mm. because it was reading for the blind, it was volunteer only, it was no characters, it was just reading out loud, it was not performing, is not, wasn't, and I, I think that there's still, there's still some, some shade being thrown that way where it's not viewed as acting, but mm. you would do well as an actor to view audiobook work as acting. Absolutely. Treat it that way. You're not reading out loud. This is not the easy job where you just get to sit and like read to your kids at night. This is like, it's a real acting job. It's a different kind of acting mm -hmm. and the different skills that you have to, and this is where, you know, getting some kind of guidance is useful. We've listed so many, we've talked about so many different ways that you can do that, but it's acting. Good. I agree. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, go ahead. I was gonna try. No, I definitely agree with that. I think I, when some people have asked me to, of like, how do you do audiobooks? And I'm like, you know, I do suggest like, take an acting class, do something. It, it could be beneficial because at the end of the day, it, you are, you are performing. It, it is, you are a storyteller and there are certain things, elements that, that help emoting like being able to access emotions and convey that um, I think is really helpful. And then not being afraid to bring your full authentic self and not letting things be barriers. Uh, you know, we are our biggest uh, enemy and obstruction. So I think definitely trying to get out of your own way and just really like giving and, and doing it and seeing what happens, you know? Great. The end. <laughs> yeah, and like breaking down a scene, it's acting plus. Yeah. It's like yeah. you're not just playing one character now, you're playing all of them and exactly. the stage. Be the how stage. Thrilling. Yes. <laughs> it is. Like, it's how so, exciting. So it's, it's so exciting. It is. Yeah, I love it's it. awesome. That's but it's why. also yeah. so much work and yes. so much acting work. Like, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, mention uh, SAG-AFTRA and the SAG-AFTRA Foundation. Oh, good. Uh, yes, my, my previous employers, who I, I'm just so fond of. Um, if you are a SAG member or an equity member in good standing, um, SAG-AFTRA, the union, of course, uh, has several resources. Um, but the SAG Foundation, which is the educational assistance arm of SAG, provides free programs uh, in every area of voiceover. I mean, I'm sorry, of acting, but specifically also voiceover. So they call it the voiceover labs. Um, the LA and New York locations are currently closed still because of COVID, but once they open up, if you are a SAG member in LA or New York, there are studios that you can use and book time. Uh, you can either uh, record yourself or work with an engineer, a voiceover engineer who will direct you. Um, and right now they have a whole whole host of things that are just online. You can also book one on one appointments with a voiceover engineer um, uh, and talk to a per um, all the engineers work in voiceover in some capacity. I know the, the person who took over for me, for me, Jennifer O'Donnell, is a audiobook narrator and she does a lot of commercial voiceover as well. So, uh, you know, if you're just getting started, it's a safe space for you to ask questions and not feel like, I don't know what punch and roll is. Can you tell me what that is? Ask those questions. Um, it is, like I said, a very safe and welcoming in, uh, environment. If you are just getting started and really don't know what questions to ask, or depending on where you are in your audiobook journey, it could be you might be further along and be like, I'm doing my first ACX book. How can I do this? But mm -hmm. um, it is an invaluable resource. And I do highly suggest if you're a union member uh, to go seek it out. Yeah. I, <laughs> I have learned personally so much. This has been a really great, a great discussion. And I hope um, the people who are listening also have found things to take away. Um, so I just want to thank you all so much you, you, for your time and all of your advice. It's been great. Thank you. It's nice to see us. you all. Wonderful. Thank you that all for so being great. here. And thank you so much, James, for leading this discussion. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, another resource I'd like to throw out there, talking about plugs, the Queer Vox online VO directory. 
um, queerbox.org. Uh, you can put your demos on our directory. And currently, the that directory is being used by, I think we're up to over 200 different casting entities, which includes animation houses, dubbing, house, uh, dubbing studios, um, interactive studios, and many audiobook publishers. So um, be sure to join our directory as well. Um, Thank you so much all for being here. Uh, to our audience out there, Queerbox has many different programs that will be coming up throughout uh, the remainder of the year. So do stay tuned for those. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thanks everybody. <laughs>